Um, we've got a little bit of a change on Fancy was going to present. For anybody who may not have heard, um, John recently announced that he's um, going to rejoin Microsoft um, after working as a, you know, having his own company for a few years, and uh, John's going to be going back over to Redmond to join the product team. And um, so I believe John's going to be on the Logic Apps team, and he's offered once he's settled in over there, he's offered to um, come and do another Integration Monday session to um, just share some of his thoughts, experiences. But he needs to kind of get over to Redmond and get settled in and everything. So um, tonight I, um, I decided that um, I've got a session that I think um, some people might be interested in, and it was kind of a little bit of a different kind of session um, where we'll we'll not talk about technical stuff, but we'll talk about some of the some of the other challenges we have on integration projects, and was kind of hoping it would just um, just you know spark some discussion, throw a few ideas around, and see. Um, See what uh, see what people think now. Sorry, just bear with me two seconds. I think uh, Nino's having problems getting into the, the meeting. I think he's got the, the old address. So um, tonight we're going to talk about the analysis part of an integration project. So most of you guys know who I am. Um, you've heard me speak before, a lot of you guys. So I'm not going to spend um, too much time going over stuff. Um, Saravana Nino's telling me that um, he's on the WebEx and he's just got it saying waiting for presenter. Um, do, you, is, do you know if there's, can, can maybe somebody in the chat just confirm everybody can see okay? Yeah, it looks uh, it's okay, uh, Mike. Uh, maybe I, think, I don't know whether he's on the wrong, wrong uh, go to meeting. Sorry, maybe on join.me. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll I'm just, just, just check. Just that. with nobody's put anything in the chat window yet, so I'm just wondering if everybody can hear okay, and it's not just me and you talking to each other. Okay, right. I'll continue anyway. Um, so before I before I get into this, I just wanted to do a quick uh, a quick shout out to a few people who um, kind of you know just helped me with a few ideas in this area over the re uh, recent weeks. So quick thanks to Nino, Steve, Jan, Kent, and uh, Mikel Sand who've you know kind of been listening to me rant about stuff and bounce ideas around and give me some things to think about. So. Um, and what I wanted to kind of propose this idea was that in many integration projects that I've seen, uh, when you start the project off, development teams often feel that they've been dropped in at the deep end because even though there's been some analysis going on, once they start this development phase, you know, often people don't really have a clear understanding of what it is that we need to do. And, um, you know, it was kind of saying, you know, if you, if you feel the same way and you see this, Quite often, just stick a plus one in the chat window, um, just to you know acknowledge that you you see a similar problem. But I've seen this on so many of the projects that I've seen, and what I wanted to do was really talk about how we can make things easier for for the development team by doing a better job in this early phase of a project. So some of the scenarios that I've come across are um, I've got four here. So the first one is. Um, a customer will ask for a feed of data from system A to system B, and often the, the requirement isn't elaborated any further than that. It's just, I want a feed of data. Can you just make it happen? The second thing I often see will be, sometimes you'll, you'll get um, what on the face of it might look quite a good um, architecture diagram, and you'll get um, all these boxes on the screen, and you'll, you'll get something like, I want an arrow from the customer system to the order system. Can you just build this interface? And again, you, you get this problem where you know it's good to get these these arrows which give you a little bit of context. But as an architect, what does that mean? And that, that there's so much more information that I need to be able to actually create that integration than just that picture with that arrow on. 
The third um, common scenario I see is where a customer will say, can I have an additional data attribute added to an existing integration process? So if, um, if you've got something where you may have um, messaging between your CRM system and your orders system, and they may decide that there's a new attribute for a product that needs to be included in that interface. And that one tends to be one of the simpler requirements because often that you know it's, it's an existing interface, you're just changing it in a in potentially a small way. And you know that, that might not be as big a deal as what some of the other ones could be. And then the fourth scenario is um, we've got an existing process which we need to change so that it also integrates with the new CRM system or new whatever system it may be. And you know, it's kind of almost an extension to the existing use case we have. And that might bring in a whole bunch of other challenges. Um, but we need to think about what the data that's going to be involved and, and many other things. And the common problem here is that um, you know, as a as a kind of an integration developer, you've got this real high level statement of what, what the customer would like but there's no real meat on the requirements. So you, you kind of, you know, you're asked to give estimates, you're asked to commit to developing something and, and actually just deliver value. But the, you know, often the, the integration requirements buried within other requirements for a project and there's not really the appreciation of the detail that's required to be able to effectively deliver that. So hence our little diagram there of our superhero developer who, you know, kind of feels like he's dropped dropped in at the deep end of what should be a you know not too difficult a project but he's really up against it from day one. And often you know you get these requirements and there's a million things as an architect or a developer that are going through your head. So you're thinking things like, you know, what are the different use cases that I need to follow? What's the process? How do I talk to each application? Is there any service level agreements? Have we got the infrastructure? There's like a million things that just often haven't been thought about or haven't been covered. So how do we, you know, how do we deal with this unknown? Because a lot of it will affect how we design and build the system. And what we don't want to do is kind of go so far with the project and realize that the lack of, of information about what we needed to do significantly affects how we would have designed or built the system. So we end up with a something like a, a system that doesn't work or we end up with something that works in a really poor way that could have been a lot simpler if we just knew a bit more about what we needed to do. So I started thinking about um, different integration projects and some of the things that, you know, some of the behaviors and, and common attributes about projects that are easy versus projects that are hard. And I came up with it with a list just off the top of my head of a few of these things and the ones I've highlighted in purple are the ones that I believe have a, a relationship to the amount of analysis that you do up front. And what I wanted to do is really kind of give an indication of how relevant getting this analysis done correctly would be um, in terms of the overall difficulty of a project. So if we pick a couple of examples here, integration's easy when it's something you've done before, when the applications you're integrating with are well understood, if the process and logic is simple or understood, Integration is a lot harder when you just don't have the information, when you're making it up as you go along, when they, you know, when you're constantly going back to the business or to the um, to the analysts to find out more information, you're always stopping and needing to check stuff. So hopefully that gives some good scope about you know how how important this stuff can be. Now what I'm not saying here is I don't say you have to get the analysis spot on up front before you do anything. That, that's not what I'm trying to pitch here, but what I'm really trying to pitch is about getting some, getting the right amount of information and the right quality. Now, if we think about analysis, um, if we don't have enough of it, then developers get things wrong, architects might make bad decisions, and a whole bunch of other problems can come into play. But also, if we do too much analysis, we can have some negative impacts as well, where you know, we can waste a lot of time doing analysis but never actually know if it's correct because we didn't validate things. We can end up doing a load of work before we start delivering any value and sometimes we can make things much more complicated. And the key thing is that both of these sort of ends of the spectrum end up with a customer who isn't very happy. Now, this, um, this graph here, it's not intended to be, you know, kind of a a factual based on you know statistics type graph it's really just for 
illustration purposes. And what I wanted to put across was this idea that there's sort of an inverted U where if you think about the amount of analysis that we do and how that relates to the overall cost and risk on a project. So if we do not very much analysis, then the project's likely to cost more and have higher risk because there's there's so much unknown. So, much, so many times we'll be redoing stuff that we get wrong. The same is true the other way where if we do too much analysis, we're going to you know, spend a lot of time before we actually really do anything. And, and the key thing on this sort of illustrations, this red circle where there's going to be an area where we, we have a sweet spot of doing an amount of analysis that's in that area is going to be the right balance between doing enough to get the job done effectively but not doing too much. And that's kind of where I want to try and help us to get to in this session. So the first thing you might be thinking is, well, all this talk about analysis is great, but I've got a methodology. Doesn't this just solve my problem? And if you think about two of the most common methodologies, so we think about waterfall and agile, and they both have places where they talk about where analysis and design fits before development. So with waterfall, we've got this nice linear process where we've got a big chunk of analysis, big chunk of design, and a big chunk of development. Whereas in agile, we've got this iteration where one leads to another, and we, we keep going over these multiple iterations till we get to the end. And the theory is really great, but in practice, I kind of find it tends to be a little bit different. So in terms of waterfall, we have, you know, often we'll have a lot of time spent doing analysis and then the time spent doing design and development's very squashed at the end of the project. But the the sort of value delivered by the analysis phase for all that time spent, the value is actually quite small. And most of the value is delivered in the development phase, but we tend to spend the least amount of time doing it. With um, Agile, what I tend to find as well is that rather than having these three activities iteratively cycling through stuff, what we tend to do is almost do analysis and development in the same sprint on top of each other, getting in each other's way, and then we deliver something that doesn't necessarily do what we want it to, but we've proven some assumptions, and then we end up redoing it and developing stuff that we missed or got wrong. And the, the key thing here is that... Um, in Agile, often for many companies, the, the whole architecture piece kind of falls out of the cycle. And with both these methodologies, all I'm kind of saying is that in practice, in the real world, it's maybe not quite the same as what it is in the textbook. So a couple of um, observations about the methodologies as well is that um, with Agile, it tends to be much more a case of just give it to the Scrum team and they'll figure it out. And Often teams don't do analysis sprints or spend enough time doing sprint zero activities. And maybe with some projects which are much better, um, much better aligned to the way Agile works, um, you know, typical web projects and stuff like that, sprint zero activities tend to be less important. But to me, in integration, this, this whole idea of an analysis sprint or a sprint zero becomes one of the most important parts of your of your project to you know figure out the hard stuff, get it right. So it makes it much easier to deliver in, in subsequent sprints. With waterfall again to reiterate, um, you know, lots of analysis up front before we do any real world validation. And the often the analyst or architect's not close enough to the delivery being done by a by a team to actually make sure it's done in line with with what the original plans were. So although you may have a, have a methodology, and I'm not saying every company, you know, lots of companies will do this quite well, but a lot of companies find that the methodology doesn't really solve the problem, and certainly from an integration perspective about getting the right amount of information. So how do we do it better then? And what I'd like to talk about first is um, the idea of what analysis is. So let's just be clear that analysis is about gathering the right information to allow us to build, design, and test the solution to meet the customer needs, but also being able to communicate it effectively through the team. So it's no good capturing all this great information if nobody's able to read it, nobody knows where to find it. And what I would say is a, is a little test for tomorrow when everyone's back at work is just go have a little think about the team that you've got and maybe go to one or two members who, you know, possibly the ones who don't, um, you know, aren't, aren't as active in meetings and stuff like that, and just ask them to, to explain to you 
how the project you're working on works, what the architecture's like, how the solution works. And I think often I've found that the, the, the real understanding of what you're building's in two or three people's heads, but the rest of the team aren't always as clear. So that, that's a good indicator that you know, the analysis and design sections may have some, have some problems that you haven't really sort of figured out yet. So what we want to do is this idea of an anal analysis and an architect working together to do just enough analysis to do an effective job. And if we kind of think about the project, what, one of the things that um, you'll tend to find in a project is that you've got all these different stakeholders who are involved. And you know, a few of them are coming up on the screen at the moment, but you've got project managers, infrastructure teams, change teams, senior management, and these guys, they all have their own view of what the project looks like. And one of the things that I'm a big believer on as an architect is that it's important to be able to look at this project from the perspective of these different stakeholders. So if you think of a, a senior manager, he may look at this this project here and see one side of it, but there'll be whole other angles and perspectives on this project that the, the guy as the senior manager just doesn't really think about and doesn't have an appreciation of things that are important or not important. So during that early phase, it's important for the analyst and the architect to be able to put themselves in the position of these different stakeholders to understand what they would need. Now, the next thing I think is important is a definition of ready. So this is the point where when you transition from the analyst stroke architect doing some work to figure out what it is that we need to do, when that hands over to somebody to build it, you need to be clear about what is your definition of being ready to, to do that transition piece. Now, some companies may decide that they want a very formal process. Some companies might be less formal about it and, and maybe they have different approaches per project. But to me, there's a couple of really key things here. So number one, do we feel confident about what we need to do? That, that's quite an important statement to me now. How many times have you started a development project where you didn't feel confident about what you were going to build because you didn't understand something well or there was so much unknown that hadn't been figured out? One of the, um, one of the things I think is um, worth thinking about from, a, you know, from the Agile methodology is this idea of... Um, measuring the readiness of, of being able to take a user story forward for development. So in Agile, they have this idea called um, invest, which is a way of looking at a story or a feature you're going to build and determining whether you think it's, um, it's ready for development. So one of the things you'd look at is, is it independent? Does it stand on its own right? Does it have other stories it depends on? Is the story negotiable? So could, could you change that story? Um, is there some scope for being able to negotiate with a product owner about any changes that might come in? Is it valuable? So if, if there's no value delivered by the, the story, why would we do it? Can we estimate it? So this, this is a key one um, because often you know, everybody's going to ask you how long something's going to take, how much is it going to cost, and if the story isn't something you can estimate, then you haven't got enough information to be able to tell you, you know, what, what it's involved to provide that estimate. Um, size is quite interesting, so if, if you've got um, a story that's really big, then you're obviously going to need more information to be able to get that through through the development process and make sure it's done right. If it's really small, you might not need as much information. And then how testable is it will often indicate whether it's well understood as well, because if you, if you haven't got a clue how to test it, then you don't know how it's going to work. So with the definition of ready being um, what I believe is one of the key areas for that handover piece, it's kind of how do you get to that definition of ready? So what I I'd like to propose is this idea that during the analysis um, part of your project, you'll undergo three iterations. Now, I'm not necessarily saying an iteration has a, f a fixed period of time. What I want to say is that I think there's these three chunks of work that you may do one, you may do all of them, and there's a, s a number of things that you probably should be thinking about in these phases to determine whether you think you're ready to move to the next, to the development part of your project. So phase one is all about um, the high-level stuff, high-level analysis. And 
what I'd like to talk about is a number of steps to go through during this phase. So the first one being the user story. And I think this is really important because number one, it, it's sort of a high level statement of, of what you're going to do. So if you think back to the um, initial requirements we got, you know, the, the typical scenarios I had at the start of the presentation, which were things like, I want a feed of data from here to here. It's kind of a rebadging of that, but using a set structure based on, on the, the typical definition of a user story. And I'd promote this um, structure based on the, you know, whether you want to call it the, the behavior driven style um, or whatever you want to call it. But this idea that in order to do something as a, you know, and take my example, as a sales director, I want to get some data from the CRM system to process credit card payments. Now, the good thing about this story is whereas we had a requirement earlier that was we want a feed of data from here to here, when we define it as a user story, we've got this um, this first statement of in order to, and that's quite key because that explains the value of the, of the user story, and if we can't express the value of why it's important, We'd probably want to we'd probably want to avoid doing this story until that's understood because it doesn't really deliver anything of use. So what I'd like to do in step one is just take the requirements we're often given and convert them to a more useful format that can make a bit more sense. The next thing we should do in phase one is a context diagram, and again this is a little bit like um, like what we might have got as our original requirements in the typical scenario, which was you know, we here we've got a very basic diagram with a few systems showing really high level some feeds of data from here to here. Now, when we think about um, an integration architect or an integration developer, we often like to think about low level things like um, integration patterns and whether it's messaging, whether it's ESB or whatever. But the reality is um, many customers don't care about that. And, and to be fair, they don't understand that detail either. And um, a few weeks back, Miguel San did a session about um, BizTalk architecture where he kind of said the same thing, which was if you're talking to a customer, this type of diagram makes a lot of sense to most customers. You know, they, they know they've got a CRM system, they know they've got an order system, and they know they want data moved from one place to another. So really the context's about, about applying some scope to it from a system perspective. So step three is about starting to go a little bit lower level now. And what we want to do is a, a typical diagram, a bit like a use case diagram, where we can define some use cases that are going to be done in our system, who's involved, what actors, and just kind of agree that with everybody on who's a stakeholder in the project. You know, that this is again just flushing out a little bit more detail with a simple diagram. You know, at this point we're not writing mountains of text like you might see in a typical waterfall project. You know, we've just got a few pictures and a statement just confirming what it is that we're trying to do. Now, after we've identified each of the use cases, a good thing for many integration projects is to look at a high-level process diagram. So for each of, the, each of those use cases, we could put together some kind of activity diagram that shows roughly how this process works, what systems are involved, what activities are involved. And to me, this is, this is often one of the bits where, you know, when we get the requirements saying we want a feed of data from here to here, well, these, these use case diagrams and the logic, um, the, the activity diagram really start to flush out things like what are the alternative scenarios that might be involved and what are the steps involved in that integration process. So now we're starting to get to a level of detail that can sort of bridge that communication between somebody who's technical and somebody who's non-technical. After we've got our process diagram, we probably want something like a, a data model of some kind. And at this stage in iteration one, I'd recommend it to be quite high level. We, we just want to know things like, you know, is there a customer, what, you know, if there's a customer, are they related to an order? Maybe we might um, do some kind of relationship between a customer in one system versus a customer in another system. Figure out what the key data attributes are. So, for example, um, you know, maybe customers are identified by a GUID in one system and identified by a, an integer in another or something like that. But if we get this... Um, diagram of a high-level data model, it's going to make it easier to talk about these things, the, 
you know, talk about this whole data through the rest of the analysis period. Next, we want to think about what applications are involved. So if, um, if we've got a requirement from the customer originally, which was quite high level, they might have said, I wanted to feed it data from here to here. And that gives us a good starting point. So we can maybe do a high level component diagram showing some of the systems that are involved. But we could also start plugging in things like, you know, have they got an interface? Is it, is it something like a web service interface or a CSV file? And, you know, we get a really simple diagram that shows how these things are going to talk to each other. And that, again, is something we can explain back to, you know, maybe people who work with a certain system who don't understand integration, but they know how the order system works. Many people in the business probably would understand this type of diagram too. But we can start thinking about the detail that we need as integration people now about things like what protocols would be supported. You know, does an application has a REST interface and a, a SOAP interface, so we might start thinking about which one we'd want to, we'd want to look at. Um, and we can begin capturing non-technical information about these applications. So who owns that app? Who are the key contacts for it? Is there any service level agreements? And we've just got this, this nice, easy way of communicating what applications are involved. The next steps about non-functional requirements. So, we, you know, how many times do you see projects where you go right through and you never really think about non-functional requirements? So, you know, early in this analysis phase, we start a list off of what are the NFRs that relate to the integration interface we need to build. Um, maybe there's some, you know, some companies we're quite lucky where there's a spreadsheet of common NFRs. In other companies, they don't really have anything. Um, it's great to be able to get find out you know general ones that will relate to it, but also specific ones as well. So maybe maybe we've got a process where you know I think I work with the university at the minute, so we, we have some processes where certain points in the year um, we get a lot of students who might join the university, and other times in the year we might have not very many people doing it. So things like an, a leave as and joiners activity has two points in the year where it gets really heavily used compared to other times. So that would be a, a significant NFR that might affect how you design your systems. And those kind of things, being able to think about them up front is quite important. Step eight would be about stakeholders. So if we're doing an integration interface, um, there's going to be many stakeholders that are involved. And one of the things that I'm kind of, you know, from my art sort of background, excuse me, working on agile projects is, Often um, integration interfaces have um, fall into a scrum team which has a product owner. But the problem is, as a product owner, it kind of like treats it as if you've got one stakeholder. But for integration, you're going to have many. So not only do you have the you know the technical stakeholders like your support team, your infrastructure team, you've got you're going to have stakeholders in all of the other applications as well as business stakeholders, and you know, thinking about how do you, how do you manage these different stakeholders is really important because it's it's maybe not fair to just assume that the business person who's asking for the um, asking for the requirement to be delivered is going to be aware of all of these ones. What you know, take an example where we get a requirement to interface with the CRM system to I don't know maybe copy customers to you know take all the customers who've just joined in the last day and integrate them into some other system now. The CRM system may have a whole bunch of other requirements going on that would conflict with what we're trying to do. So we've got to kind of find that balance and identify who the stakeholders are and possibly use a stakeholder map to work out who are the stakeholders we need to actively work with, who do we just need to keep aware of what we're doing. And I think being able to identify those people up front is going to help you a lot later on. Step nine is really where the architect's um, going to be a lot more involved now. So the analysis um, person's been, you know, been collecting information through as we go. There's been bits where the architect's um, been helping, but the key bit is the architect at some point early on is going to get a feel for what type of integration it is. And you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that um, you know, trying to identify is it is it some kind of API and services project. Is it an ESB messaging thing? Is it batch-based orchestration? Is it simple? Is it complex? That's going to have a really big impact on 
the technical decisions that you'll make for the project. So getting a feel for that early on is quite important. And maybe as an architect, we should be starting to document why we think it fits one of these patterns. And that may also determine whether we use technology we already have, or it may determine that we need to bring in some new technology to support that pattern. And uh, the last step for phase one is about a candidate architecture. So at the end of this iteration, I think the architect needs to put together some kind of diagram that um, explains how this is going to work. It doesn't need to be really low level, but I think a combination of combining an activity diagram and a, and a component diagram seems to work quite well from an integration perspective. So you can see an example on the screen here where I've got um, the CRM system pushes some orders into BizTalk and then we've got a little bit of an activity flow showing what's going on. This demonstrates some integration with the order system via some interfaces. And this is something where I should be able to sit down with anybody in the team and kind of explain this architecture from this diagram to them. But it also starts calling out things like patterns we might be using. So I've got some enrichment patterns in here, for example. And at this point, um, the architect probably has a, a good feel for how confident he is about this design as well. But it should be something where we can, we can come out of this further iteration and go, this is how we think we need to build this system. <laughs> and I thought that was the um, number 10, but there's a number 11 that I put in yesterday as well. So, <laughs> um, and One of the other things that I think is um, quite useful is um, this integration catalog idea. So I was working on a project recently where um, the project had about nine or 10 different interfaces. And one of the, um, one of the challenges was um, everybody was communicating on email about all these different interfaces. And I was just finding that my inbox was just completely full of, of emails saying interface specification, you know, interface process, et cetera, et cetera. But all these emails were talking about different things. So what I um, what I like to have with an integration catalog is just a simple list of these are the these are the integration processes or interfaces we're going to build. Here's a common name that we can all call each one because I don't want to be talking to Bob and it be called the CRM interface and we talk to Fred and it's called you know customer claims or something like that. We need we need a common name so we all know what we're talking about. It's useful if you can identify any source or destination systems involved. We can mention the um, the type of integration, and then we can we can you know from this list we can call out to wherever we've started making notes on the different types of integration, the use cases, the requirements, and stuff. And this this can really be our kind of um, our point of you know single point of entry for integration requirements for this project, and it just links to the detail which we're collecting elsewhere. And I think the the catalog is probably more important if you're on a project where you've got quite a few integration interfaces to build, but if you've just got one, maybe two, it's probably not as much of a deal. So if we think um, think about this iteration one, we've what have we done? So we've gone through, we've created an integration catalog for a project. We've captured some user stories and high level context. We've got a process diagram for each interface. We've got the data model. We've identified who our applications and our stakeholders are, and we've come up with this candidate architecture. Now, at this point, what we need to decide is, do we feel ready? Have we met our definition of ready? So to me, the key thing is here, do you feel confident about this process? Because if you feel confident and you can articulate that confidence to the development people, then you're probably going to proceed straight into development. And for some of the simpler projects where it's stuff that you already as a team understand already, you might just be good to go straight into that um, into that development phase. If um, if you feel that there's complexity or there's you don't have a good understanding of stuff, you might need to go and do some more work. So that really comes to the summary of iteration one, where it's a it's a decision that are we ready? Aren't we ready? And if the answers aren't we aren't ready, and we need to do more more analysis. Then we can then jump onto um, iteration two. And iteration two is really about getting the detail. So we've kind of decided here that we've got some good information, we've got a good high level understanding. We need to figure out more detail, but what do we what bits do we have to cover where we're going to find this detail? And I think 
in general for many projects there's three places where we probably need to look to figure this stuff out. So number one's about the processing logic. So what is this process and logic that's required? What transformation takes place? Are there any patterns in here? And that's often going to be in the the you know the middleware piece of this integration project where we need to we need to look at what what do we need to build here. The second place we need to look is about application connectivity. So when we're going to talk to an application, do we know which application it is? Do we know how to talk to it? Is it got an interface that's well defined? Um, the third place we need to think about is the data. So what does the data in each application look like? Does it correlate with each other across systems? Are there any um, complex transformations or reference data mappings we need to do? So during iteration two, what we want to do is a set of activities that will help us flush out this data or this information. And my thoughts on how to do this start with step one, which is flushing out the features. So here I'd recommend using something like um, Gherkin or you know, behavior-driven development approach where we're doing a specification by example. And in this case, we're using the given when then syntax to be able to define plain English descriptions of how the system is going to work. So at a high level, we had our process diagram. This has really taken this one level lower to to um, example specifications of what's going to happen. And I think two of the things that we'll find out here are, one, a lower level confirmation that we think the, the green path process is correct, but also we're going to find some exception scenarios as well. And they're one of the areas that many projects um, struggle with, which is we've, we've built something, but we forgot about a certain exception scenario, or when an error happens, what do we do with it? And um, one of the one of the things that we think is quite important in this area as well is to confirm what are who are the owners of these exceptions. So if I get, you know, an error where the CRM system is going to be down, well, do I just leave it for the BizTalk admin to sort out? Do I send that to the CRM team? You know, do I just tell the business this didn't work and you're going to have to just manually sort it out? Those, those kind of things are those more complex, lower level scenarios that we need to flush out in this kind of activity. Step two is about the data. So we have this high-level data model pre before, but we've decided that we need to go a little bit deeper now and think about what the actual data looks like. So the first thing to do is, for each of the systems, try and get some example data. Now maybe that would be a, a legacy system might give you a CSV file. We might have some more modern systems where we have XML or, or REST-style interfaces. So maybe we can get some WSDL, some Swagger, JSON, XML, and, and all those different flavors of description of that um, of that particular data. So if we've um, if we've got some clear definitions, then it's much easier to do the mapping. And as we come onto the mapping, we've got to think about things like well, it, it, you know, data from system A versus data from system B. Are they in different encoding formats? Do we need to transfer that? How do we handle data that might not transfer very well? Are there any reference data scenarios? So, for example, um, you know, if we're if we've got a list of customer types in System A, which might be A A B B C C, and in System B the customer types are one, two, three, and seven, how do we map those across? So, you know, they, these are all scenarios your dev team are going to need to figure out, and you know, have some rules to, to describe that that transformation. So. You know, those kind of things are things we can think about up front and start engaging with the, the various application teams to get the information we need. Maybe we're transforming numbers, so how do we transform an application with leading zeros to a one that doesn't have leading zeros, or maybe we've got three decimal places, another application has two, and you know, there's, there's all these different, different things your dev team are going to have to build in something like a BizTalk map, and if they don't know the answer to the question, they're going to come back and ask the architect and the and the analyst it later. So there's an opportunity to get that information up front so we can just go, we know you're going to need this, here it is before you start. Um, I guess just to call out one, um, one particular thing here on the reference data map. And so one of the things I often find with reference data maps is if you've got these lists of customer types, 
it's quite important to think about how how that data changes and what that means to the interface. So, for example, if I um, if I get a new customer type added to System A, who, how do I make sure it gets added to System B? How do I um, if it doesn't get added to System B and I get one that comes through and doesn't have a mapping, what do I do with it? And those kind of problems can introduce new interfaces. So sometimes you might have your mapping database might need to be automatically updated from both systems. So there's a whole new integration requirement that just came from that one problem. Step four then. So step four is about application integration capabilities and how do we talk to each app? So maybe if we're in BizTalk world or in API apps world, maybe we've got out of the box connectors. But are these connectors well understood? Maybe they're ones that come out of the box, maybe they're open source, maybe we buy them from a partner, but also we might have to develop them ourselves. And all these different things could have a different impact on your project in terms of cost, risk, and, and that kind of thing. You know, the, probably the biggest challenge is um, if we need to get a connector that we have to buy, that has um, a requirement to get involved with a purchasing team to to acquire a new piece of software and that can take three or four weeks and you know that that's something that needs to be thought about for later in your project because you don't want your dev team starting with making commitments about delivery and then find out they need to buy an adapter that you know sort of impedes them for three or four weeks um, with these application connectivity pieces how will the security work are there any throttling requirements so if my CRM system only takes 10 messages um, concurrently, but my ERP system is going to send 100,000 messages in, in 10 minutes. That, that's a big, you know, big throttling requirement you've got there, and that can have a big impact on how you would design the system. Again, non-functionals. So um, to keep it really short here with non-functionals, just do another iteration of looking at what they are, go through them with the stakeholders again, and just see if any new ones have come up see if anybody's got any new comments about the ones that were previously there. Um, the architect probably needs to think about patterns next, so with all the information we've got, we've, we've gone over it a couple of times, are there any obvious integration patterns, are there any patterns that we've implemented in our project that we can reuse, and this is all about finding common language and common ways of implementing solutions to a problem, and if we can go to the, to the dev team this requirement here is very similar to this one you, you built three months ago. It's just a little bit different like that. That, that straight away puts you in a place where it's, it's sort of familiar. And if you're in a familiar place, that breeds confidence and it's probably going to be easier to build. Um, step seven is about design decisions. So at this point, as we're getting into the detail, it's probably a more complex project. And we've probably had to make a few decisions about our architecture about some of the um, some of the requirements, and I think it's important to keep making a note of these so they can be communicated. And you know, um, if you think about many projects, how often do you get into a situation where you're, you're working with something that somebody's decided, but you don't really know how they decided it? You don't maybe you're not convinced it was the right decision, but it's never documented. Um, you know, we want to be in a position where we can look at decisions were made, challenge them see that they were valid, see there was some justification for them. And again, it doesn't have to be a massive amount of work, just say what, what you decided, why you decided it. Um, we want to make sure these are easy to communicate, so when the dev team are building a, a solution and they're you know, a couple of months into this project, they can look back and know where to find these decisions that were made by an analyst or an architect earlier in the project. And then step eight is about our candidate architecture again. So if we think about all this extra detail we've got, is our candidate architecture still good? Maybe things have changed quite significantly and we've gone, you know, maybe we've decided that our original architecture needed BizTalk, but now we don't need it anymore. That would that could be a quite drastic change just by getting extra information. Maybe we didn't need BizTalk originally and find now we've got some really complex stuff and we do need BizTalk. Um, the, I guess it, it's really just making sure that you're happy that the architecture represents what you want to build still and change it if it doesn't. 
So iteration two was really about um, getting this extra detail. So we've used specification by example as a way of getting some concrete information about the various scenarios that our process needs to handle. We've defined the data in more detail and we've def sort of figured out some of the key mappings, not necessarily every mapping because some of them will be really simple, but some of the really important ones that could be either architecturally significant or have a big impact on the project in some way. We figured out our patterns and our architecture and now we need to think about the, the decision again. So are we confident about the process? Are we confident about our architecture? Do we feel we understand the complexity of this project? And this come back, comes back to our definition of ready. So if we think that we're ready, we're happy, we can go ahead, then we can hand that over to the dev team and they should be in a good position to get on and deliver the project. But if we're not happy and we think there's, there's still more to do, then we need to think about iteration three. So iteration three is really about, you know, if, as I was saying before, these, these shouldn't necessarily be, um, or I'm not trying to say they should be a certain length of time. I'm just saying there's a certain amount of stuff you should do. And um, what I'm saying here is if you're going and finding more information that you didn't have before, then you probably haven't really done a, the right job on iteration two. Because iteration three is all about looking at the areas where you felt there was risk and trying to reduce that risk. So what we might do is um, probably the two areas where you're most likely to have risk is around the process itself or the application connectivity. And it's funny because they, they were the same places where we tended to think that you know more of the detail would come from. So one of the things we might do is if we think about our candidate architecture and we think about the process itself, so that's really the piece in the middle. You know, that this piece that I hear I've got in BizTalk where we're kind of um, you know going going through this set of activities that'll get data from places, transform it. And what we could maybe do is try a proof of concept where we can stub out parts of the system and do a proof of concept that would focus just on this process and logic. So if we said, um, rather than our candidate architecture, we did this stub where it did some, like a mock of these activities where the CRM system could call something like a REST API and it would get a call back later. This allows us to focus on the fact that we thought the CRM system may not work with the, with the process when we build it. And what we can do is simulate that process to see does the CRM system work the way we expect with that back-end process. And it, it's really allowing you to focus on the parts of the system that you're most concerned about and figure out does the process logic actually make sense and does it seem to solve the problem for the system. So you wouldn't need to build the entire thing, just focus on that key bit where the risk is. Step two is about an application integration POC. So this one um, comes up comes up quite a bit in my opinion. Um, I tend not to see that many um, projects that do this, but I'll tell you two stories that I think um, might be interesting. So with this, what we're trying to do is um, develop a set of tests that talk to a system using its interface and basically say, does the system work the way we expect it to work before we start building our whole BizTalk project that integrates with it? And what we'll do here is develop a set of behavior-driven style spec flow tests written in C-sharp that'll you know, just make some calls to that API. So one example where we've done this recently was um, a colleague and I um, were doing some integration with SAP. And for this company, it was the first time they'd really integrated with SAP. And what we did is we wrote some um, .NET tests that would basically interact with Babies and SAP to allow us to insert data and, and extract data and have a look at what this data looked like and, and see, you know, was there anything unusual about it? Was there anything um, that we thought would make it difficult when we came to do the integration project? And this set of behavior tests, um, you know, didn't take a long time to do, but it really made us confident about how we would integrate with SAP and what the data looked like, that it took away risk from other parts of the project, excuse me, other parts of the project later on. Another example of where I've done this um, is I, I did some work with a company in um, in Hong Kong 
and we were working with a company who were based in China who had a an application where the interface document was pretty big but also in Chinese um, so you know trying to interface that application not only does it have the technical challenges but it also has the language challenges where maybe something gets lost in translation and when I start plugging in the application uh, the integration engine to the application it doesn't work the way I think it's going to work so by rather than you know spending a lot of time trying to get my whole project to work what I could do is do a small proof of concept to talk to that interface and just make sure it works the way I think it does but also give me a component that I can get out again in six months time when we make some changes and say does the application still work the way it worked six months ago and that's all about about reducing the risk of, of that sort of interface piece so after we've um, looked at these two core areas and we start reducing this risk again we want to revisit our um, candidate architecture same questions as before is it still a good candidate are there any new things one of the things we might have figured out was that when we talk to the order system, maybe they've got a, um, a traditional CSV upload interface and they've got a web service interface, and maybe we find that the web service interface was, wasn't really very good and didn't really meet the needs of the project, so we decided to swap to the CSV interface instead. That That's something that I've seen happen in projects before, and if you think that doing that, doing a proof of concept to help you make that decision is a much better place to be than finding out that you're getting into system test UAT and the interface just doesn't work so you've got to refactor this whole big part of your project so it's about you know identifying that risk early mitigate it so you can make the right decisions for later so checklist for iteration three then we've um, we've done some proof of concepts we've reduced the risk in our key areas and we've updated our architecture candidate now, at this point, we um, we need to think about how we feel again. Do we feel confident about it? Do we have any concerns? Have we mitigated any risks? If we if we still don't feel ready, then the, the chances are we probably haven't done iteration two or three properly. So it might be worth going back and thinking: Is there any more proof of concepts we should do? Is there any more? Um, is there any more detail we should be flushing out from from those phase two sort of tasks and hopefully at this point the answer to are we ready is always yes and you've now got the right information to give to your dev team to get on and do the job so if we look back we did three iterations and the idea was we want to get just enough analysis to set us up to be successful we would use the iterations that are needed not necessarily all of them all the time and we need to make sure that the information is clear and can be understood by anybody, which is why I've um, recommended certain things like certain types of diagrams, certain ways of capturing user stories, and certain ways of capturing scenarios and definitions. And I guess just to, to wrap up really is that um, I think you know very few companies that I've worked with um, have got this idea of a, or a defined definition of ready for that handover of um, of stuff from analysis and develop and um, design and development. So, I'd recommend that in in your team, maybe you should have a chat about what kind of things, you know. Firstly, what information do you get that's missing? What information's incomplete and what makes it difficult? And then, is there a way you can mitigate that through the definition of ready? So, for some companies, you might have um, projects where you need to be very formal, and you might say we explicitly want a, a process diagram. We want a use case diagram, etc. For others, you might be more fluid about that and just and just take the right information and go with a gut feel of do we feel ready? Um, I think that it'd be interesting to kind of see what people's general thoughts are on that and you know how many companies go go each way. But what I wanted to do um, as a takeaway for a community thing is um, you know that this is probably one of the first times in the in the Microsoft integration community I've really seen. Um, a lot of talk about how do we do this um, non-technical part of integration projects and I think it's really important because it kind of sets you up for success or sets you up for failure or sets you up to have a really difficult time and I'd like to put together some guidance to help people in the community around this 
Um, so what I wanted to do is do a bit of a shout out to say, look, if anybody else has similar views, um, feels there's the same gap and would like to get involved in some community activity, um, please let me know, um, reach out and I'll see if we can maybe coordinate some activity and, and put something together and I'm sure Saravana and the guys at BizTalk360 or maybe TechNet Wiki can help us um, get that kind of information out there. But uh, otherwise, um, that, that's really it for my presentation. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, I'm not really seeing a lot of stuff coming through on the chat window, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping everybody's been, um, there's still 52 people here, so I'm assuming everybody's um, been able to hear everything okay, and um, just to open it up for any questions, really, if anybody's got any. I'll also um, check the, uh, the user group website, see if we've got any questions up there.